What's up, y'all? As promised, after a million fucking years, is the rest of the exercise selection tier list for the recreational lifter. Some of this will apply to you if you want to do powerlifting, any professional sports or athletics, but this mainly has a gym bro in mind. What would a gym bro do or use in the gym to get as strong and as big as possible? With regards to horizontal press, hip hinge, squat, and an overhead press. I have accessories in another video. So things like curls, pull-ups, shit like that. We're going to keep it real short and sweet though. Because I want to have this done in like 30 minutes. How are variations ranked? Hypertrophy, strength, utility, ease of use, technical carryover, and stimulus to fatigue. This is just to preface everything by saying that each exercise is ranked in different areas. So, well, you can come, you can come in my comments and comment, oh, blah, 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 I like this exercise because of this and you're wrong. But just recognize that I'm prefacing it by saying if you like front squats, yeah, it has its pros, but it has cons in other areas. So if you see it ranked higher or lower than exercises that I think are higher, Shut up and listen first. So, what are the ranks? Of course, S through D. No need to say or go into any further what those mean. If you've read a tier list, you know what those are. The tier list itself. Now, this is the first part of it. Now, keep in mind this is overall rankings S tier, feet up bench, three count pause bench, push ups, leg press. Romanian deadlift and snatch grip or or easy curl bar hyperextensions or back extensions. A plus tier, deficit lunges, shortened range of motion, paused or stiff leg deadlifts, 90 degree back extensions, paused or football bar, overhead press, push press, incline bench with regards to overhead press. Keep that in mind. A tier. Competition bench, no matter what your range of motion is, if it's short, long, medium, each has their benefits, their strengths and weaknesses. Something weird just happened to my headphones. I got scared. Oh, shit, my iPhone. I'm not editing that out. My my computer was making weird noises because of my phone. Um, Competition bench, no matter what compensatory strategies you use with an arch to shorten your ROM, It's A tier. Football bar bench, dips, low bar squat. You guys can read that shit. It's been on the screen for long enough. I'm not reading all that. So these are the variations that we're going to talk about today, along with stipulations that kind of differentiate a movement that is otherwise the same aside from range of motion. So if you're a big arch bencher, obviously you're an above parallel ROM. And by above parallel, I mean... You're barely bending your fucking arms. So if you're a little above parallel, I'm talking about the parallel ROM bench. If you're a little below parallel, I'm talking about the parallel ROM bench. So on and so forth. Again, I'm not reading all that. You guys can pause. And here we go. First, we're going to talk about the bench with parallel range of motion. Hypertrophy A. The range of motion on a bench press, if it's done to parallel is great you know and the more range of motion that you have on a movement in general the better the hypertrophy stimulus from it is going to be it's a in absolutely every category it's easy to teach it's easy to learn it'll have technical carry over to every other bench press that you do it's stimulus to fatigue is decent because our chest muscles can't push as much absolute load as our legs and our lower body can And in terms of utility, everyone can use a bench press in their training program. So failing if, you know, an exercise is very specialized because I'm not going to say, oh, this has great fucking utility on every exercise. You're going to use most of these exercises. Just spoiler. You're going to use most of these exercises in your training program, right? Unless it's shit or it has a very particular usage that you wouldn't use all the time or most people won't get a use of. Not much to say about a standard textbook bench press. 
where we need to start talking about how things change, but overall it still makes it an A tier is the range of motion that you use. So an above parallel range of motion bench press is absolutely fucking lutely dog shit for hypertrophy. You're not moving the bar. Some people, if they have a really good arch and take a really wide grip, they get like an inch or two of range of motion. You're, you, you're, you can't grow from that. You can't. D. Strength, though, is S+. plus. You can push the most amount of weight on an above parallel row bench press compared to any other, any other bench press variation. It's like the rack pull above the knee of bench presses. In terms of utility, though, Everyone should be aiming to do the most, use the most arch and take the widest grip that they possibly can to get the most weight on the bar. So utility is A. Ease of use, though, is C because it takes a lot of skill practice to be able to get your arch to that level. Technical carryover is D. Just like with the rack pull, you're not going to get a a bigger deadlift by doing rack pulls, but you will get a bigger rack pull by increasing your deadlift stimulus to fatigue is s plus you're not moving the bar anywhere you can do an above parallel wrong bench press six times a week below parallel has more range of motion i have a natural below parallel bench press if you have a natural parallel bench press well this it's a different exercise for you and again if you have a mcdonald's arch vegeta hairline bench press it's a different exercise for you but I push bench press heavily because for me, I bench below parallel and it's S tier in terms of hypertrophy because of the range of motion. For C, eh, not the best. You're not going to be the world's strongest bench pressure with a below parallel uh, range of motion. You can be strong objectively. I'm stronger objectively than most people on the bench press, even if they have better leverages. But however, their leverages are better. So you know, I can't get to the same level, even with the same amount of muscle mass as if someone with lower range of motion than me. Utility. S. If you can bench below parallel or use a bar that where, to where you can bench below parallel, ease into it. But that level of stretch and range of motion is incredible. So if you have a buffalo bar, fucking use it. Easy use. A. No bench is hard to do except for the McDonald's arch bench. Technical carryover, S. The more range of motion you do, the easier it will be to push weights when you have less. And stimulus to fatigue is, eh, it's okay, it's decent. Feet up bench, S++ if below parallel, S++ if parallel, S in general. If you remove leg drive, you're not going to be able to use as much absolute load and you're going to isolate your upper body to a greater extent. So in terms of hypertrophy in the areas that you're using, it's incredible. Do it. Strength, S. Utility, S. Ease of use, B. The only reason why it's not S is because some dickhead is going to slide off the bench because their feet aren't on the ground and they're going to injure themselves. Technical carryover, S. Stimulus to fatigue is still B. Overall, it's S, though. It's the best bench press variation that you can do. Football bar bench gets shit on a lot in powerlifting, but in terms of general recreational use, it is amazing. Hypertrophy A, strength B, utility A, ease of use A, technical carryover C, which is why powerlifters shit on it, and stimulus to fatigue is A. It's a shoulder saver. Three count pause bench is the, I would say the second best bench press variation that you can use no matter what your natural range of motion is. Hypertrophy, it can either be D if it's below, that should say above parallel, it's a typo and I'm not fixing it. D if it's above parallel, A if it's parallel, S if it's below parallel. I don't go off a script guys, so as I see things. I'm seeing it really for the first time alone with you. Strength A, utility S, easy easy use B, technical carryover S plus because nobody pauses their bench presses long enough. Or you may be an individual that has difficulty with that. And stimulus to fatigue is S. Here's where it's different from a regular bench. Your overall load is going to be lower because you're pausing for a lot longer. Its utility is amazing because 
pausing is a skill that everyone should get good at. Technical carryover is amazing because, again, pausing is something that you should be good at. Hypertrophy is also incredible because your time under tension with that pause at the bottom is going to be incredible. Dips. Probably the best pure hypertrophy movement you can do for your chest other than like a feet up bench. The the difficulty though is some people can't do dips without snapping their shit up. But overall, it's you know, if it didn't have those technical shortcomings just intrinsic to its movement and depending upon the user's bone structure, it'd be right up there in S tier. But what do you do? Push ups are S tier though. They're really easy to do. They're foolproof. Their stimulus to fatigue is incredible, meaning if you have a chest or pec injury, you're, you more than likely can still do push-ups without as much pain as a bench press because your, uh, your scaps move freely, and a lot of people have trouble doing that on bench, even if you cue them to. Hypertrophy and strength, they're good. They're not the best, but all those other fringe benefits in terms of programming and variation, they make it S-tier in my opinion which is a no-brainer. That's why every armed force organization, all fucking police organizations, they test the push-up because it's a great test of upper body strength that isn't as dangerous as a bench press for the average normie. Incline bench, it's decent. Not much to say about it. It doesn't have the best carryover. It's not the best for increasing your bench strength, but it's good for hypertrophy and it's easy to do. Good stimulus to fatigue. If you want to use it as a variation, if you can't do the others or you don't want to for some reason, you're not really going to lose out on any hypertrophy. You have plenty of strength work to do, so it's you're not losing out. Squat variations. I'm not reading those. I will pause so that you guys can read it, though. This is your opportunity to pause. Okay, here we go. Low bar squat, hypertrophy, D. See if you pause it, though. Low bar squats in terms of hypertrophying your quads are dog shit compared to every other squat because you're using your lower back and all your hip hinge muscles, if you're a good low bar squat or even if you're a shitty one, to a huge extent. Strength, though, for that very reason is S. You will low bar squat the most amount of weight. Whatever percentage that happens to be for you personally, it's irrelevant. You'll be able to push the most amount of weight on there if you practice it for long enough. And it's S plus in terms of building strength if you pause, you know. Technical carryover is S. Stimulus to fatigue is C because it's basically a hip hinge that uses your quads a little bit more than a deadlift. High bar close stance squats, a.k.a. Non-power lifter squats. Non, uh, I want to. I'm not a politically correct person, but I almost said non-fat ass <laughs> squats. Um, but I don't want to say that because if you're an individual that needs to lose weight, that's someone that I help generally. But a fat ass to me is a a, a neck beard ass power lifter with broke dick boomer opinions that likes to squat with a super wide stance to barely parallel. That that'll say, oh blah blah blah, high bar blah 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 squats are shit because blah blah blah. Shut up, boomer. Fuck up. Anyway, I like to put a little of my personality and my humor into these videos. So take it or leave it. Hypertrophy for this is really good. It's amazing if you pause it. Strength wise, you're not going to be able to use as much weight as if you use every compensatory strategy that you can use. But in terms of utility, just off of the strength of the amount of hypertrophy that you can build with it, it's 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 something you should use at some point or is a great option for you if you just need quad hypertrophy. Are there better options for quad hypertrophy? Yes, and you will see. But it's pretty good. Tempo squats. Very vastly fucking overrated in the powerlifting community. It is good for... Really, for the most part, in enforcing a good bracing pattern on the squats, it's not good for hypertrophy because the loads are really low and you're not doing that many reps. It's not good for strength for the same reason, but it's really good at teaching something that a lot of people fuck up on. And 
because of the you know aforementioned bracing benefits, its technical carryover is really good, and the load is low as shit fit comparatively to other squat variations with a barbell. So stimulus to fatigue is great. Front squat done by a highly skilled weightlifter with good leverages that isn't going to collapse like a banana when they go into a half-ass front rack. I am not one of these individuals. My front squat looks like absolute shit. I don't have the mobility. It looks like a gym bro front squat. But uh, Olympic weightlifter front squat is incredible. A lot of Olympic weightlifters have front squats that are very similar to their back squats because they can stay completely upright no matter what stance they take. Really good for hypertrophy. Really good for strength. Utility D. How many of you guys are highly skilled weightlifters? I don't care how long you've been front squatting for. Were you born on a, not a concentration camp, but like a, a Chinese weightlifting or Russian weightlifting camp, which is almost just as fucking bad because they treat children horribly. I digress. If you're not one of those motherfuckers that has no utility for you because you can't do it and has no ease of use because you can't do it, but great technical carryover if you can, good stimulus to fatigue. Overall, A. Womp womp. But if you're a gym bro, like we all are, even if you're a power lifter, even if you're a strong man, even if you're a professional athlete in a sport unrelated to weightlifting, you're a fucking gym bro when it comes to this movement. Hypertrophy. C. The front squat, other than the Zercher squat, is the only squat that is limited by your upper body strength. If your upper back fatigues, you're not going to be able to do the movement. And that can happen far before your legs are fully challenged. For that very reason, it's just form de- degradation, the fact that no one can do it right, ease of even getting some form of technical proficiency with submaximal weights, stimulus to fatigue because your upper back is getting the shit beaten out of it because it's too weak to squat in the positions that you put it in. If you're someone that has good leverages for squat front squat, I'm not talking about you. You fall more in the uh, weightlifter front squat. So save it before you come in the comments. SSB squat, really good, especially for individuals that have bad shoulder mobility and can't comfortably squat with a lot of volume with a barbell. An SSB squat is going to be really good for allowing you to get through that range of motion without pain. Additionally, the utility is really good because you can do Hatfield squats, you can do lunges with it, and that's more speaking about the bar than the actual exercise, but because of kind of the orientation of the weight, it's really good for hypertrophy, really good for strength for the same reason, but for the very reason that you would use it, it doesn't have the best technical carryover other than the fact that it's a knee extension movement because you're not practicing holding that bar stabilizing the left and right force i have hiccups sorry belt squats not my favorite uh squatting exercise but it is very good and i have i had been i'm not currently as of right now using it at the moment uh sorry i got a notification on my youtube i'm just reading something uh hypertrophy a Really good for hypertrophy, but not the best because most belt squats, even like the free weighted ones that I primarily do, don't allow you to get your biggest range of motion that you possibly can. I still go parallel or lower, but ass to grass, no, you can't achieve that on a belt squat. Not safely, anyway. Like You can stand on 20-inch boxes if you want and resign it either to YOLO if I don't... If I die, I die. Like that fucking rep. Because if you fail on a on a box squat or a belt squat on that particular setup, you're going to fall through the boxes and bust your ass. Or you're going to do sub-maximal work and then it doesn't have the most utility. But overall, I'll say it's an incredible exercise. Everybody should use it. It's really easy to do. It's foolproof. You cannot know how to squat with a barbell and still know how to belt squat. Stimulus to fatigue is incredible. Oh, but we have to talk about it because I made a YouTube video about it. Well, uh, 
the belt uh, pushes on the pelvis and stops it from interiorly rotating and exteriorly rotating, and it causes your sacrum to posteriorly tilt, so blah, blah, blah. Use it once a week, guys. You don't have to worry about the belt pressing onto your pelvis or moving your sacrum if you're using it once a week. Don't be a fucking wimp. Lunges. Really good movement. Better if you do it from a deficit. More range of motion, better hypertrophy. Otherwise, it has more or less the same properties as the standard version. I would say it has a little technical better, a little better technical carryover if you do it from a deficit because the range of motion is more equivalent to like a, a ass to grass squat. But the stimulus to fatigue is really good. It's very tiring and an like an intra workout capacity, but in terms of the absolute stress that it puts on your body. It's not much, guys. You're, you're using a fraction of the weight. Leg press, S-tier, best leg exercise in general. Squats are better in other areas. Leg press is better in others. If you want to get a good squat, do not use leg press for that purpose. If you want to be strong in general, do not use leg press for that purpose. But if you're trying to build your quads with an exercise that is easy to do, you can throw into any training program and has a great stimulus to fatigue, there is no other leg exercise that fits those qualifications. The belt squat is the closest one to it. And then it's worse in other areas where, where, the, where a barbell squat is better. Leg press is better in every metric other than strength and technical carryover. If you have an argument for me, come in the comments, but keep that in mind before you say so. Range of motion equivalent, meaning if you can go below parallel and you can set the leg press up to be able to do that. If you go below parallel and you can keep your back straight, which you can learn to do if you take the time to do the leg press correctly, you're not putting any force on your lower back, you're not loading your spine, you're beating the shit out of your quads, but mm, not, very, not, not very fatiguing. And a, a, a brain dead monkey could do a leg press. So it's really good for easy use. Leg extensions. Really disrespected exercise, just like the leg press. Power lifters, the broke dick boomer power lifters will swear, oh, leg press is a shit tier exercise, blah, blah, blah. Shut the fuck up. No, it's not. You're just a shit tier fucking trainee. You don't know what you're talking about. Leg extensions are kind of around those, that same, along the same lines. They're really, really good for the, for the fact that it can rehab your, your quad if you're having tendonitis that's where most of its utility comes from added to the fact that it's free quad tonnage free quad volume if you do it and you have knee pain or you're doing it like a dumbass you're you're not controlling the weight yeah you'll have knee pain and it won't be the best option for you if you're an idiot but overall it's free leg tonnage and it has great stimulus to fatigue you can throw, you could probably do leg extensions every workout, even if it's not a lower body workout. Deadlift variations with added stimulate stipulations regarding range of motion. I'm going to pause for a second because I'm not reading all these because I'm going to read them in a second. Pausing. Boom. Here I go. Deadlift with a large range of motion. Now, this is, this is here's how I break this down. If your conventional deadlift is your large range of motion lift, this is the movement that I'm referring to. But if you're an individual where your leverages allow a conventional deadlift to have a short range of motion, this is the one I'm talking about. Conversely, if your sumo deadlift allows you to deadlift with a shorter range of motion, this is the movement that I'm talking about. So on and so forth. No matter which variation you're talking about with a short or long range of motion the hypertrophy is garbage it's just garbage everybody knows that strength though deadlift is the best one of the best builders of strength in general in terms of making you as strong as possible 
in relation to other deadlifts, it's not the best, which is why it's just an A, but uh, someone that can deadlift 700 pounds is going to vastly overpower someone that can deadlift 300 pounds. Um, utility is S. Everybody needs to deadlift, like I said, unless it's very fringe usage or it's trash, you're going to use it or you can use it or should use it. Ease of use is A. Technical carryover to other pools from the floor is S. Stimulus to fatigue. Wah, wah. Deadlifts with shorter range of motion are better for strength for the express reason. The less range of motion that you have on a particular lift, the more reps that you can do with the same percentage. Meaning, on a conventional deadlift, if that's your long range of motion deadlift, you can do probably five or six reps with 85%. On a large range of motion deadlift, you can probably, or a short range of motion deadlift, you can probably do like 10, depending upon how short it is. I have clients that can do 12 reps with 80% on the sumo deadlift. I have clients that can only do 5, 6, 7. The shorter your range of motion, the more reps you can do with a higher percentage, meaning you get more strength-specific work. Very good fucking strength stimulus. Not good for hypertrophy because, one, the load is still fucking enormous and two the range of motion is garbage but utility s if you can do it you absolutely should be doing it if you care about being strong easy use b just because a lot of the time it involves learning an opposite stance deadlift and kind of figuring out the technical cues and leverages to that but it it could i could argue to be a Technical carryover, of course, is still S, and then stimulus to fatigue is C because it's a it's shorter range of motion, even if the the load is uh is longer, is is larger rather. Pause deadlifts, another A plus tier. D for hypertrophy, S plus for strength. Better bracing, better foot pressure, better hinging mechanics. Self-limiting variation that you can't use as much load on. All of these things contribute to more absolute strength and pounds on the bar being used. Use pause deadlifts just off the floor. By just off the floor, I mean as soon as you break it off the floor, you pause. One Mississippi. Up. There you go. Boom. Technical carryover S+, plus because it teaches good form, punishes bad form, and better form means better carryover, obviously. Romanian deadlifts, S tier. It's uh, I think there's another S tier hip hinge, but hypertrophy, strength, utility, technical carryover, all S. Well, how is uh, the technical carryover S if I'm not pulling it from the floor and blah blah blah? Look, look, guys. Here's the thing. Most people, unless taught otherwise or they learn otherwise, deadlift like absolute dog shit because they don't know how to properly hip hinge deadlifts or Romanian deadlifts in particular teach you how to hip hinge. It's just what they do. They teach you how to hip hinge. So therefore it can, it has carryover on every other hip hinge. If it's teaching you how to hip hinge, it it, it teaches a strong bracing pattern as well, because you're stopping it just far below your knees or just beneath or just on top of the floor, like an inch or so above inch or two. You have to you have to keep braced pretty hard to stop from folding over in like a in half like a fucking banana. Hypertrophy goes without saying it's S. It's the only deadlift with a with an eccentric. It's the only deadlift with an eccentric other than stiff leg deadlifts as you choose to do them with the tempo. For that very reason, it's better in terms of stimulus to fatigue, but it's still not the best because the load is still enormous. Stiff leg deadlifts, hypertrophy. It's 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 really good in terms of hypertrophy. It's less beneficial in terms of hypertrophy in ter- when you compare it to Romanian deadlift, but it's still really good. So if you're more excited about stiff leg deadlifts, do those, or if you just want to switch it up, Stiff leg deadlift is going to be the the variation that you'd want to use to keep, you know, all all your all your adaptation the same. The technical carryover isn't as good though because your how you pull with stiff leg deadlifts is entirely different than how you conventional deadlift, but it's still decent. 
45 degree back extensions are S tier overall if you do it with an easy curl bar or snatch grip. But they're worse for strength. So if you care more about strength, do it Pete Rubish style. If you care more about hypertrophy, do it the other way. Not saying one is better or worse. Well, I am saying one is better. The easy curl bar version is better overall. But there are benefits in other areas where I would say the Rubish version surpasses it in this way. But then the other one surpasses it in all these other ways. So do that one. If you're looking to get gain benefits in those other areas. This is the only hip hinge that has an excellent stimulus to fatigue that you can still load to infinity without fucking up the movement pattern. Good mornings are not good for that. Ease of use, S+. plus. It's foolproof. If you can't do a back extension, probably you're a moron. I say that unapologetically. That's not to say if you fuck it up the first time and you look at it and you say, oh, my back curled here or oh, I need to have the pad lower. No, I'm not talking about that. That's just experimentation. If you dead ass with someone correcting you or you correcting yourself can't fix that, you're a moron. 90 degree back extensions are better than the Rubish extensions. Not as good as the easy curl bar extensions because the joint angle is less specific to the deadlift than a 45 degree version. Good mornings are good. They're really good. Not a lot of people do them though. You know what a lot of people do? They do that bullshit. They do a squat morning and then call it a good morning. It's a, half, a quarter squat is what you're doing. You're not doing a fucking good morning. A good morning is relatively stiff legs. The bar's way over your foot. And that's just what it is. The leverages are entirely different. It has really good utility in everybody's training program. If you have a slot where you're like, oh, well, I'm going to train my hip hinge for like sets of uh, 20, 15 or 20. And that's kind of what I want to do in this slot. This, this slot. You can't load good mornings and do them properly. Very heavily. You can't do, go past your body weight plus 10 pounds because you'll fall over. You'll either fall over, which your body isn't going to do unless you consciously try to force yourself into that position. Or it'll do what it does naturally and it'll just you'll just push your butt back further. The bar will get further under midfoot. And then the heavier it gets, the more that'll turn into, oh, well, my bo- my, your body's like, oh, well. Motherfucker, I'm just going to do some knee extension to, to get this weight up. And it's all subconscious. You can't stop it from happening. But if you're a dumbass, yeah, you'll continue to load your good mornings to infinity and still expect to get all these benefits, hypertrophy, all the stimulus to fatigue. At the moment when you load 500 pounds onto a bar with a squat morning, your stimulus to fatigue fucking plummets. Your hypertrophy benefits plummet. Because no one muscle group is getting the amount of stimulus that it otherwise would in these other specialized areas. Strength is pretty good, though, because the load is pretty decent. Technical carryover D. This squat hip hinge. What the fuck is that helping you with? It's not. It doesn't have better carryover to a, a squat than a squat. And it doesn't have better carryover to a hip hinge than a hip hinge. It's like the it's like a it's like a fucked up version of two things put together. It's kind of like how if you put chocolate sauce on a ribeye steak, yeah, if you ate it and be like, "Oh, this is it nasty." Like it's not repulsive, but it's like th- it's fucking worse than either one by themselves. Don't do this one. Overhead presses, and this is the last section that we're going to kind of talk about. And then we're going to close the video off with some final thoughts. Not reading these. You can pause and read them yourself. Barbell overhead press. If your goal is to push the most weight overhead, you still need a requisite amount of hypertrophy to do so. Meaning, if you're very proficient at a push press or a split jerk, you're still going to want upper body brute strength because the more brute strength you have there, you still need to lock the weight out and hold it overhead. Barbell overhead press is really good for off-season training for strong men and individuals that care about the split jerk. 
paused overhead press is a better version of the regular overhead press. It's not worse in any area. It's just better in the areas that are that are good. So your touch and go reps are good. You can use pause reps as another variation and and not not lose out on any benefits. Do them on a different day though. So it'd be like secondary day. Uh, and this is in an off-season program. Secondary day, uh, touch and go overhead press. Primary day, paused overhead press. Seated overhead press is pretty damn good too. In terms of ease of use, I'd say it's easier to do and to teach than a standing overhead press. Stimulus to fatigue. Uh, I mean... In some areas, it's better than an overhead press. I have it as C, and that's ranked lower than the overhead press. And I'll kind of explain why. Oftentimes, when people do seated overhead presses, they're using loads that are larger than their their overhead press. So the stimulus to fatigue is going to be lower because you're using more load. But if you use equivalent loads and just do it for more reps, the stimulus to fatigue is better. See that? In that case, it'd be A. Dumbbell overhead press, nothing to say about this. It's the bodybuilder version of the regular overhead press. It's pretty much the same fucking movement, except for you're not going to be able to express as much strength because of the fact that it's just more unstable. It's just like a dumbbell bench. It's the same thing. You're not going to gain the most absolute strength doing that. The Olympic overhead press, which is what how people used to overhead press back when the overhead press was an Olympic lift, is the standing bench press. Strength, S+. plus. Everything else is dog shit, though. It's meh to dog shit. It's really hard to learn how to do that safely. A lot of people will try to do it. They'll arch way back, and they don't have the fucking the lower back strength, the core strength, or the, the body awareness to do that without snapping their shit up. So it's, it's not easy to do it's not easy to teach it's not easy to learn but if you want to push the most weight overhead other than a push press or a split jerk you this is the variation that you're going to want to do if you're not someone that wants to learn those other two movements or you can't this is easier to learn than those but eh, i'd argue that it's more dangerous so push press incredible movement with regards to increasing your overhead press. That overload at the top of the lockout, if you if you have an instance where your sticking point is just above your head and you can't lock out, a push press is going to train that last bit a, a lot harder than you could on a conventional overhead press. So it's going to be like a limit breaking a limit breaking uh, variation for you. Plus, it just looks cool. Split jerk. Uh, it's really good in other areas, but it's not as good in terms of hypertrophy because you're really using your fucking legs and a lot of compensatory strategies to get the weight up. But it's still a damn good movement. The football bar overhead press is probably the best overhead press variation that you can do. Hypertrophy is really good. It's really really good on your shoulders it also puts the load a little bit farther out in front of you than it would on a uh on a step like a, a barbell overhead press so you could argue it gets a little bit more upper chest a little bit more like front and side delts because you're using a little bit more load it's just really good it's a shoulder saver good stimulus to fatigue it's not any harder to do than a regular overhead press in terms of learning the mechanics. You still open the window, push your head through the window, lock out. Boom. Everybody, if you care about overhead press, should be doing football bar overhead press if you have a football bar. Or a Swiss bar, whatever the fuck you want to call it. And I think this is the last exercise, guys, but it's the incline bench. Now, it's ranked B for the regular bench because it's just meh. But for overhead press, though... Mm. You're using more load on a on an exercise that's more vertical. Look at look at an Olympic overhead press. Look at the back angle that they take when you do that. Now look at the back angle you take when you do an incline bench. It's the same thing, right? It's pretty similar. Here you go. You get all the benefits of the uh 
the Olympic overhead press. None of the compensatory strategies, none of the momentum. You're gaining a shit ton of strength. You're gaining a shit ton of muscle. It's really good in terms of utility as well, but the technical carryover isn't good because it's not an overhead press. Overall, it's really good though. Yep, that was the last one, guys. I wanted to make this video because it was more a more succinct version of the multiple part videos that I was doing before. And this is kind of the definitive one. Now, it's not every movement that I do. Like, I do have a, a couple secret exercises, so to speak, that I'll, I'll make a different video about, you know, that, I'll, that I'm experimenting with. But overall, here's the tier list. I'm not scrolling all the way back up. This video has been a pleasure to make. If you guys have any questions, if you have any critiques, any disagreements, there are no sacred cows in training. I would be happy to debate you. Until next time, though. Peace.